Welcome everyone to Impact Investing 101. Usually it takes a minute or two for everyone to get online, so I will honor that um, and just do a little bit of a preamble before we dig into things. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I was doing a little bit of reflecting this morning uh, about this webinar and really I hope it's an opportunity that we can engage with everyone here. Uh, please do go to the event chat or the stage chat, either or, or okay, I think we're on the event chat and ask questions. Um, I really want to be able to engage and give back and, and, and provide guidance wherever we can in this webinar. Um, so uh, a little bit of information there on that. Uh, my name is Mari Matthews. I am the Business Development Director with Spring Activator. I've been with Spring for about five years. Uh, so that's kind of the scope of the time that I've been working directly in the impact investing space. Um, today, we are going to be uh, giving this webinar together with our incredible partners, Genis Capital Management. Genis is Canada's one of Canada's leading uh, wealth management firms um, with a focus around impact investing and ESG investing. So they really are the experts in the field and, and so honored to have them here today to speak to you all. Um, so what we will be doing um, in a few short minutes is handing over um, the presentation to Shannon Ward and Jill Bester um, of, of Genis capital management and once they've given a presentation that are of around you know 15 20 minutes long um, we will uh, stop take a deep breath and then go to a panel discussion and welcome any questions in I will help moderate those questions coming in from the chat so feel feel free to throw those in to the event chat along the way we do have some questions that we'd love to kind of address as well um, at the end of this webinar so um, and uh, and I will say too joining us on our panel I'm very happy to have um, uh, our Olivia Hornby, who is a member of the Spring team. She is the, the managing partner of Spring's Impact Fund. Um, and uh, so she'll be bringing her insights and experience from her perspective as well, which is great. So um, yeah, sorry, without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Shannon Ward, who is Genesis Chief Revenue Officer, and also over to Jill Bester, who is a partner at the firm. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Mari, and thanks so much for having us today. Um, we've been a partner with Spring for a few years now, and it's always such a pleasure uh, to do these collaborative uh, events with you all, so thank you. Um, I wanna actually talk, before I start to get into a little bit more about Genesis, I'd like to talk about Spring a little bit more because I wanna start with the impact um, investing ecosystem in Canada. And the, the, that ecosystem has really been fundamentally, I believe, changed by spring. So prior to spring, most private equity investments required a person to be what's called an accredited investor, which means that you had to have $2 million in investable assets to invest. Um, so that doesn't mean properties, that doesn't mean your house, which led to, I think, a very reasonable question, which was, what about the rest of us who want to do good with our investments? And I think Spring has done such an incredible a job with their Impact Investor Challenge of encouraging and enabling non-accredited investors to get involved with impact investing. And it has truly blown open the doors for what is possible for people who are interested in impact investing in Canada. And I really believe that Spring is one of the major catalysts for growth in the space in Canada. So first of all, thank you all at Spring for doing what you do. Um, so the area that Spring plays in is the private equities space. And that's really only one part of the impact investing ecosystem. Uh, however, it's definitely, I think, the sexy part of it, if there can be such a thing with investing. And as such, they, you know, the private equity investments get a lot of the spotlight. And it's for very good reason. Um, today, though, I want to talk to you about the decidedly less sexy, but also just as vital uh, part of the impact investing ecosystem, which is the public markets. So we like to call the public markets the other 90%. So why is that? It's because as a rule of thumb, investors are guided to hold no more than 10 to 15% of any one asset class in order to have a diversified portfolio. And that of course includes private equities. So let's say you've invested at Spring or you've invested in another private impact investment, you know your money there is going toward the impact that you wanna see in the world, which is fantastic, well done. 
And I also have a question for you that might be challenging. What about the other 90% of your portfolio? So the good news is that you're already likely investing in the public markets in some way and your portfolio is diversified. So you might have an RSP, you might have a TFSA, you might have an RESP, and you certainly don't need $2 million to get started with those types of investments. And those are all examples of public market investments. But the question that I want you to ask yourself and walk away with today is what impact are those investments making in the world and how do they align with what you want to happen in your own values? So the thing is that all investments, no matter what, have an impact, every single one. And the bad news is that often that's not a positive impact, especially in a resource heavy economy like Canada and particularly in the public markets. But now with Genesis, there's a way that you can have a positive impact with that other 90% of your portfolio. So I want to get into a little bit about how that works in the public market space, because it's a little bit different than private markets. So often people ask us, can you really have impact with public market investments and still see a decent return? That seems like having your cake and eating it too. And I guess it is sort of a bit like that, but there is a trade-off. You can most definitely have impact in the public markets, and we often see market-like returns but it does look a little bit different than it does in the private market space. So I just wanted to go through the differences a little bit first. So when you invest in impact in the public markets, it's not as specific and it's not as direct as you can get with the private space. You don't have direct access to the companies that you want to invest in and you can't hand select them much like you can do in the private space. So you can't say, for instance, I want to support companies in clean tech who are in BC and who have a women founder. In the public markets, you would apply your impact in a broader stroke. So we use broader strokes in the public market. So for instance, you could support climate action by investing in a fossil free fund. So what you get in exchange for sacrificing that specificity and that direct contact with the companies is you get lower risk and you get more liquidity. So let's go into exactly how the impact part of it actually works and how we apply that at Genesis. So with Genesis, we use the UN Sustainable Development Goals, there are 17 of them, as a framework for deciding how we will construct our funds and portfolios so that we can have the impact that our clients are looking for. Each of our funds has different UN SDGs that are associated with it, and we have all 17 to choose from. And there's basically two approaches that an investor can make when they want to have impact with public market investments. One is divestment and the other one is engagement. They're very different, but they don't have to be in opposition to one another. So divestment means that we actively avoid investing in companies that don't have the impact that our clients are seeking. It's pretty simple. Engagement, on the other hand, means that we actively invest in companies to essentially buy a voice on behalf of our clients so that we can put pressure on those companies to make the positive changes that we're looking for and act in a socially responsible manner. And that's basically done via something called proxy voting. So really honestly, we could sit here and debate for the rest of the day which strategy is more effective, but the truth is that it depends on who you are and what your goals are. And that's why we highly recommend that you get professional guidance when making public market investments, particularly in the impact space, because this really isn't as simple as green or not green. So let's talk about the next level of how we apply um, that impact lens. We use screens, ESG screens at Genesis. And what ESG screens are is essentially filters that we use to control the investment universe. So we have an investment universe, think of it as a total number, total amount of companies that we can invest in. And then we apply screens to exclude, if they're, they're negative screens, to exclude the companies that we don't want to invest in basic, based on areas that they might be involved in. So some of those examples that are on this slide can include fossil fuels, tobacco, alcohol, weapons, that sort of thing. 
Now that's the one you hear most about is the negative screens. There's also something called positive screens though. And the positive screens can also be thought of as best in class screening. That means that we're going toward those investments. We're looking for sectors, companies, projects that are selected particularly for their positive ESG performance relative to their industry peers. So all of that is kind of you know, abstract when you see it on this, um, this slide, but it gives you a little bit of, of an intro. But what I wanted to do is give you an example of how this actually works um, in action. So this is an example uh, that we like to talk about, um, which is Tesla. I'm sure most of you think of Tesla as a green company, right? They're an e, you know, EVs, are the biggest thing that they do. So why wouldn't we invest in Tesla? And I think that this is a really interesting um, question, and it leads to some specific things about Genesis that make us different from other asset managers. So you'll notice on the left that we have all of our product screens. So we have the ones that I already mentioned. So do is it do they are they involved in fossil fuels? Are they involved in weapons? Are they involved in nuclear power? No, they're green. All of these green means go. We'll go toward them in terms of investment. We also have some additional screens that are specific to Genesis. So we screen for indigenous conflicts. We screen for high carbon intensity, um, major fossil fuel financing, and overall ESG risk. Now again, all green. So we're all good so far. And that's where we get into the controversies. So the controversies are another layer of ESG um, screening that we do and research that we do that relate to just that what are the controversies that have been happening in that company recently? Now, Tesla has had a lot of controversies recently. So they get a red for overall controversies. And you'll notice that they're not doing spectacularly in labor, product, community, or government or governance either. So the issue with that is that the yellow screens mean that, you know, if enough of them add up, we won't invest in them. But the red are just a no-go. So overall controversies is a no-go for Tesla right now, as well as reduced inequalities. We want these companies to be working toward um, reducing inequalities, and Tesla failed in that regard. So that is an interesting example, I think, of how something might appear green on the outside, but when you're really doing all of the research and the back-end um, data analysis that uh, Genesis does, you start to uncover different things. And this is where I think we stand out and we're different from most asset management firms. So we are really um, reliant on multiple streams of data. ESG investing, particularly in 2023, requires a massive amount of data analysis. And so we wanna make sure that we're getting that data from as many and diverse reputable sources so that we can make the best investing decisions. So often asset managers right now will use one source of data for their ESG ratings, and that is good. We believe in this case more is better. And so we use that diverse set of data providers to help paint the most accurate picture of the companies which we, we are evaluating. And the Tesla is a good example of that. It's because of that additional data, those additional data sources that gives us the deeper insights with which to make our decisions. And I really believe that it's that deeper level of decision making that helps Jenna stand apart with our funds. Now, on the other side, we have engagement. So as I mentioned, engagement is basically where you invest in a company and you buy a voice so that you can pressure that company into making the changes that you want to see in the world. And we do that on behalf of our clients. And the way that we do that is through a, um, a partnership with an organization called SHARE. So we are a member of SHARE and they represent over $90 billion in assets under management that large a number really buys some power. So it allows us to be part of a group that has critical mass and we become a powerful force in driving the changes in ESG practices that we're looking for. Now, I had hoped to have 22 da 2022 data um, by today, but unfortunately I haven't got it yet from Share. So I'll give you some data from 2021. We endorsed 70 engagements with Share in 2021 that involved 56 unique companies. So we essentially were able to put pressure on those companies in the way that we're looking to in order for them to make the ESG uh, changes that our clients are looking for. And we have a lot more power with that with our partnership with Share. 
So on that, I'm going to hand it over to Jill Bester, who's going to talk a little bit more about the funds themselves so that you can understand how the funds actually work and how we put everything together to make sure that our funds match our clients' values. Terrific. Thank you so much, Shannon. And uh, welcome to you all. We're thrilled to uh, be a part of this event and bringing you some hopefully value added information. Um, first, we're going to start off with the anatomy of an impact fund. Um, at Genes, we are uh, asset managers and we manage our own individual pooled funds. Um, and the values based investment spectrum is very broad. Uh, we have our what we deem conventional funds, which are responsible funds. Uh, they all uh, are available to any of our clients. Um, so those screens that they undergo are ESG integration, tobacco, and extreme carbon. So we, uh, you know, obviously don't invest in in companies that are creating extreme carbon outputs in all of our funds with Genesis. We are incredibly proud of our fossil free and our high impact funds. Um, these go through more uh, you know, rigorous screenings. Our fossil fuel free funds obviously exclude fossil fuels, weapons, alcohol, GMOs, and other controversial products. And um, we look at indigenous conflicts, gender diversity, misalignments, reducing inequalities, um, and controversies in high carbon intense companies um, we exclude from our fossil free funds. And then on the far right, our high impact funds are actually focused on um, initiatives with companies in the healthcare industry, climate action, education, responsible consumption, clean energy, and much more. So we're very proud. So there's a different varying degree on the spectrum of different types of investments that we have based on the values alignment with the client's needs. Next up, I'm just going to share a little bit in regards to our high impact equity fund. Uh, it's managed by our investment team in-house at Genesis. Um, our high impact fund invests in mid cap and large um, companies, uh, global companies. Um, many of them are um, outside of North America who are making a leading positive difference environmentally and socially. And um, the strategy is to st strive to outperform the global markets through um, a thematical approach. We seek to generate both financial and sustainable benefits with our high impact equity fund. And it supports capital markets for companies providing strong and disruptive sustainable solutions. So we uh, are incredibly proud of our high impact fund and uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals in which uh, we align uh, the companies in which we, we hold in our high impact fund. Again, Shannon alluded to if you have your cake and eat it too, are you going to give up performance if you are investing in companies with high UN Sustainable Development Goal impact measurements? That has not generally been the case. You can see on this chart here going back to June 2014, uh, the, the Genesis High Impact Equity Fund annualized rate of return um, has been 11.03% which has slightly outperformed our benchmark, which is the MSCI World Index, which is the basket of all of the companies available globally. So you can have your cake and eat it too, as we say. So equity markets are obviously different than the fixed income markets. And at Genesis, when we tailor a portfolio for our clients, we have to look at their risk tolerance and perhaps their income needs. Um, Genesis introduced in April of 2021, our Genesis Global Impact Bond Fund. It's the only global fully fossil free green bond fund available in Canada. You can see from this slide here that we, within our fixed income realm of our investment product solutions, are investing in uh, renewable energy, low carbon transportation, and energy efficient projects. Um, a lot of clients are, are still a little um, uncertain in regards to what a bond is. And I always say a bond is where you're lending money to do good works in the global impact bond space. And from that bond, you 
receive an interest payment or a coupon uh, that it creates an income stream for you. Um, so that's our global impact bond fund. It's just been launched in 2021, and we're very proud to have Alpha Fix, uh, our sub advisor from Montreal, uh, who co advises on our bond impact fund. Next, I'm just going to share a few highlights in our impact uh, fund spotlight. Um, one of our, our current holdings is First Solar Impact. It is a solar technology uh, company that aligns with UN Sustainable Development Goal 7, which is affordable and clean energy, and um, the UN Sustainable Development Goal 13, Climate Action. Um, First Solar is uh, the largest manufacturer facility of solar in the U.S. It has a $22 billion market cap, and uh, it obviously has a 100% net impact score in regards to uh, the revenues from the company uh, are going towards United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Another one of our current uh, spotlight holdings within our impact fund would be Vertec Pharmaceuticals. Um, Vertec Pharmaceuticals is a biotech company um, that aligns with uh, good health and well-being, as well as quality education through their Vertex Foundation. Um, they're trying to increase um, interest in STEM, as well as strengthen innovation and skills. Um, they are working on therapeutics in regards to um, sickle, cell anemia, sickle cell disease currently, as well as type 1 diabetes. Um, and they obviously collaborate with some major um, pharmaceutical companies. You'll notice Moderna there as well. We often get clients question, how do I know if it's working in regards to measuring your impact? And we are incredibly proud at Genis to be the leaders in this space, we uh, had to put our money where our mouth was. So um, our team led by Mike Beeson, our chief um, investment officer on the sustainable um, impact um, portfolios with Genis, um, developed with his team a portfolio net impact score. So all of our, our uh, clients on a quarterly basis can actually see what the their net impact score is based on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We measure carbon emissions from the, the portfolio based on the companies held, the total oil and gas reserves, the overall ESG scores, the environmental benefits versus the environmental harms and the social benefits to develop a net impact score. Because of in our slide here, you'll see the TSX, it's the top blue on the far left, that has, if you are just investing in the Canadian markets, which many investors in Canada are very focused on the Canadian market, if you were to buy an index fund, a Canadian index fund, your net impact score would be about minus 18 on the scale based on carbon emissions. If you look to the far right, however, our high impact fund uh, has a, a net impact score of 55% meaning 55% of the company's revenues are driven based on United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which we're incredibly proud of. So the how-to in regards to working with Genis. Um, we have recently launched a digital wealth management platform for clients who have a minimum of $100,000 to invest. Um, that would include your RSP, your TFSA, your RESP perhaps for your children. Um, and this is a little bit um, more about our digital wealth management offering. For those who would like to obviously work with Genis, um, we're you know, you're exactly who we, we want to work for the spring and the impact um, focused community. Um, there is obviously management fees associated with um, any investment management solution that you choose. And we're very proud to say that um, uh, for our digital wealth management offering, um, for the first million dollars in this offering, uh, the management fee is 0.90%, which based on a comparison, which I've done in regards to um, some of our competitors and the, I've chosen this vision fossil fuel free balance fund um, at uh, RBC, your management expense ratio, if you were to invest in that fund is 2.03%. 
the management fee of that is 1.75. So um, you can actually invest with Genis for about 50% less cost in regards to your management fee. On that note, I implore you all to reach out to me if you have any further questions. My contact information is obviously on this, the following slide and um, I'm gonna now hand it over to Mari for our question and answer. Well, thank you very much, Shannon and Jill. I really appreciate that kind of thorough overview of, of Genesis and not just Genesis, but also kind of the market and what the opportunity lies in impact investing. So um, thank you for that. So we're going to, uh, I just want to reiterate, um, we, you know, for anyone online, uh, feel free to throw uh, uh, any chats into or questions into the chat. Um, there, There is no such thing as a dumb question. I really, I really think that it's an opportunity opportunity. We want to give back. We want to engage with everyone here. So please do feel free. Um, you're also welcome to send a private message if you would like as well. Um, I will keep an eye out on my private messages. Um, but for the meantime, um, we do have a few questions that I would like to um, ask our panel. Olivia, first of all, welcome to the stage. Um, before we kind of get get into these questions, can I hand it over to you briefly to do a quick introduce, introduction of yourself and, and the work that you're doing on the Spring Impact Fund? Sure, thanks, Mari. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here today, and thanks, Janice, for having me as well. Um, as Mari mentioned, I'm working on the Spring Impact Capital Fund. So we are a venture capital fund that focuses on seed stage Canadian entrepreneurs that focus on the areas of health, and uh, planetary health, so climate, et cetera. Um, so we're what well, we 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 like to think ourselves as of ourselves as like the deep impact space. And I think Shannon touched on it, you know, highly tangible, but also um, private markets. Um, so we like to invest in founders um, that we can see and hear and interact with. Um, you know, really excited about our strategy, and I think it it complements nicely what Genesis is doing in the public market space. Um, so happy to answer any questions regarding, you know, private markets, uh, venture capital, uh, and impact investing. And I, I also spent a lot of my career in the public market space, similar to, to the Genesis folks. So, um, yeah, just happy to be here today and, and hopefully we can, uh, uh, just dig into, to some of the, uh, the questions that you guys have. Thank you, Olivia. So I'm going to jump right in. Um, the first question that we have uh, or that I have for, for the panel is, as the impact investing space continues to emerge and develop, um, figuring out where to start can be challenge, a challenge for any investor. Um, what would your advice be? Maybe I'll hand it back to you, Shannon. What would your advice be uh, to someone who's interested in impact investing but doesn't know where to start? Sure. And I think this is <clears throat> a common issue. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, frog in my throat. Um, I think it's a common issue today because there actually are many um, opportunities and many options um, and they're growing every day and it's hard to know, you know, sort of which is the best for you. Um, so a couple of suggestions. Um, one is, you know, to be looking at diversification. So look at, you know, all types of investments, um, not just private, not just public. Um, definitely get your feet wet with spring in the private space. I mean, I think it's the logical conclusion um, there for sure to, to sort of um, figure things out, particularly with your IIC investor, um, impact investor challenges, where you get a lot of education in addition. And I think that's really the main challenge is getting the education that we need to be empowered investors. And that can be hard to find, which is why doing these kinds of webinars is so important, I know, to us at Genesis and to you at Spring, because until you are empowered with that knowledge, it's hard to know what to do. Um, the other thing is if you have um, investments at a more traditional um, asset management firm or a bank, have a conversation with them, right? Start asking the questions. Bring up impact investing, because in all likelihood, they're not going to bring it up with you. Um, start to ask the questions about how aligned your current investments are with your values. And if you find that they're not that aligned, then you're empowered to make a change if that's what you want to do. Um, so I think that's that's sort of the two main areas where I'd uh, recommend. The other thing that is brought up a lot, so it hasn't come up as a question yet, but it normally does um, 
in, in the sort of broader rooms that we're in is what if I don't have a hundred grand, right? What if I don't have a hundred grand right now? And I really want to get started. And I know that I don't want to be involved, let's say with RBC or, you know, some of the main banks that we know are not out there doing great things in the world. Um, there are lots of impact and green focused ETFs out there. There are tons. Um, so they are accessible to you go out and see what's available um, because those do not require a hundred thousand dollar investment and you can get started very at a lower price point the only caution that i have for those is make sure that you're being really careful about what funds or what companies are actually held in those funds because those funds particularly i'm finding can people can be um succumb they can succumb to a bit of greenwashing uh so again just make sure that you're doing your homework um i think jill you had a um a url that you were going to mention that people could go to to find out what holdings are in a specific fund and i think that's a fantastic tool for, for people yeah thank you that would be great you're, oh jill you're muted you would think we we would realize the mute button here yeah. Um, in regards to uh, any uh, ETF or mutual fund that you may be interested in researching, I always ask my clients to dig deeper in regards to the top holdings of those companies. And I, again, through, uh, you know, my own research for, for you know, clients that hold ex existing ETFs or mutual funds through their bank, um, have kind of mind blown a few of them in regards to pulling up the fund fact sheet of that individual fund and the realization that many of these fossil free and impact funds are holding as the number one holding as Shannon said is the Royal Bank. Well, our friends at Eco Justice right now might have an issue in regards to the, the quality of um, information perhaps in the greenwashing space that the Royal Bank has done. However, it, it, on the top five ESG ETFs, the Royal Bank seems to appear on the top of each one of these um, fun fact holdings. So really dig deep, um, research, uh, you know, at the actual underlying holdings. The fund manager obviously is buying and selling stocks, uh, but you can definitely get a clear picture by looking at the fun facts of any investment that you might be looking to invest in. Great. Thank yeah. you both. And yeah, I was going to turn it over to you, Olivia, as you've worn both oh, hats. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, totally agree with, with what you both said. And thank you, Shannon, for, for pointing out the challenge. And um, just to um, clarify for everyone, you can join a challenge if you're unaccredited for as little as $2,500 in investment and you'll make a real direct angel investment into a company. So love the program. I was part of the, the women program, investing in women founders last year. Um, so, so thank you for plugging that and completely agree about um, what you said regarding ETFs and, and what's out there. And I just wanted to point out as well, um, with any good investment strategy, uh, when even institutional investors, high net worth individuals, when they go to set out their portfolio, it comes with a good plan. And I think that, you know, a lot of people starting out maybe don't have a plan in place. And so what you might have heard of before is an investment policy statement, for example, with, with high net worth individuals. Um, what I might recommend is um, having a th thought through what's your plan in regards to your impact. So what's your impact statement? And at spring, we have an impact thesis statement. So we implore everyone to kind of spend a little time on that, because I think impact can mean different things to different people. So to give you guys a sense of kind of what's in there, it's what's your mission, uh, what's your why, and then mapping out what you would like to see in regards to impact to the UN SDGs is a great way of trying to calibrate like, okay, what's what's my mission and how do I invest in things that align with that mission? Um, we, we see a lot of funds now using the, the UN SDGs, so it's a pretty standardized way of trying to categorize impact um, across asset classes. So. I'm um, happy to share that kind of impact thesis workbook, but I think um, it's a great way to kind of get started to think about um, what's my mission, what's my impact, and then you get into how do I put this through uh, to a diversified portfolio across different asset classes, and then from there, you can look within each asset class, how do I um, implement that impact? And so you might have a little bit different implementation on the private markets versus your public markets. But I think at the end of the day, having a bit of a plan gives you that kind of peace of mind that it's all coming together and doing what ultimately you'd like your money to be doing. 
Love that. Thank you very much for that perspective, Olivia. Um, really appreciate it. So um, the second question I have for the three of you is just around greenwashing. I know there's been a little bit of kind of um, hints or chats about greenwashing, but there is a lot of greenwashing and impact washing um, being talked about currently. Um, how would you advise an impact investor to avoid falling prey to greenwashing? And, and perhaps this is an opportunity as well for Janice to speak a bit about the B Corp certification um, and how that can counteract some of the greenwashing as well with, within different companies. Great question. Um, Janice is incredibly proud to have been recognized this past year as uh, B Corp Best for the World in our um, customer uh, category. Um, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the B Corp certification, it's a rigorous um, uh, you know, seal of approval that we seek uh, every couple of years in, in regards to uh, what the work we do as a firm is, including our diversity and inclusion, our um, our governance strategies, our environmental, you know, um, sustainable develop like our our own in house sustainability in regards to um, the work that we do in our offices. Um, so a B Corp certification for those who have you gone through that process is you know very comprehensive in regards to who we are as a firm. And um, to have that recognition as best in the world, um, we we are incredibly proud to um, be the only asset manager in Canada who has received that um, in the customer category. Um, uh, in your other question in regards to greenwashing, what I really do encourage my clients to do when they get their, their quarterly statement at Genis, um, we give you your top 20 um, equity holdings. Again, the, the, an asset, allocation based is based on the suitability of the client. Some clients will have 100% stocks or equities in their portfolio. Others will have, you know, maybe 10% equity and 90% bonds. Um, so I always dig ask my clients to really actually go into the invest, like go into those companies and go into the tab in regards to the company and get the actual investors, um, you know, notes and minutes in regards to their ESG and, and their initiatives. And it's easily found there. Um, a lot of companies, you know, historically have have made proclamations in regards to um, being, you know, green certified or whatever. And you can really, you can, there's an interesting a website that you can actually will identify the top 10 companies globally who have been called out. Uh, for greenwashing, and um, I, I would suggest that you might be interested. I, IKEA being one of them in regards to their sustainability uh, in their forest practices, which was really interesting because that in itself would lead me to reconsider, you know, my purchase in regards to where I'm I'm buying that next coffee table. So um, it's really interesting to dig deeper in regards to companies that have had controversies, and then obviously as investors or consumers, we can make you know decisions based on knowledge um, and not um, pie in the sky kind of um, proclamations that some of these companies have made we can actually dig a little deeper and so just do your research yeah thanks for that Jill Olivia Shannon any comments around greenwashing thoughts yeah, I, I could just add a little bit around um, reporting with this as well because you know there's a lot to digest uh, in terms of information, again, that is available to you. All of this information is out there. Uh, the question is, how is it sort of curated for you in a way that makes sense for you in your portfolio? So that's something that is very, very important to us at Genis is that our clients easily and quickly understand the level of impact that their investments are making in a way that is um, not only effective, but also simple. Uh, and that's why we developed the net impact score so that every single quarter, our clients know exactly where they stand in terms of impact. And so if you're looking at an impact investment, particularly um, on the public market side, ask your asset manager about their reporting as well, because if the reporting isn't where it needs to be, you're not ever really going to know what's actually happening and whether that impact is happening in a way that you want it to or not. So reporting is becoming much more important, I think. And I, I would add on to that, um, even when you're selecting your investment manager, wealth manager, 
Um, do your diligence, you know, ask a series of probing questions to try and understand, is the intentionality there? Are they actually following through on processes that consider ESG or consider impact? How are those decisions made? How are those decisions imp uh, implemented within your investment process? So I think what you'll find, the, you know, the more you probe, you'll find some managers um, effectively greenwash with their ESG approach, and it's not actually built into their process. Um, maybe they're putting some data, but it's actually not something that they're really discussing or considering. You can ask, you know, who is your um, your ESG manager? How do you control for um, ESG considerations? And you can find out pretty quickly if it's just you know some analyst off the side of their desk who's putting a check mark versus you know, someone who's incorporated it into their, their real diligence process. Um, so don't be afraid to ask the questions. The more questions you ask of your wealth managers or investment managers, the more that they also um, hear you, right? So I think investment managers, wealth managers, and companies, public companies as well, we all act for our clients. And so if we want to see change in the areas of ESG or climate or whatever, as customers, we need to ask those questions. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we do have another question for the panel, but I want to jump into a question that came in on the chat um, because I love this and I think we can kind of reflect back on some of the points that have been um, spoken to throughout this conversation. But um, from Christine, curious about the group's thought on ESG investing compared to impact investing. Thank you, Christine, for that question. And um, I will hand it back over to the panel. You guys can jump on who wants to comment first. I'm happy to start. I'm, I'm, oh, okay. Um, in my in my opinion, um, when I think of impact, I think of uh, more thematic. Um, I think of so um, a theory of change or an intentionality that you want to make with your investments. So, if it's equality or a specific uh, portion of climate um, or a specific region, let's say, so it's it's quite um, intentional and specific. And when uh, you look at the, pump, the private markets, you can get a little bit more specific and say, I just want to focus, for example, on a region, on a particular country, on a specific type of industry. As you get to public markets, I feel like that fades a little bit and you get more into what we call like thematic investing. Um, and I also think um, I like to think of private markets as kind of like we're investing in the companies of the future. We have more control in, uh, in, in the say of those companies in the sense of, you know, we have a greater percentage of ownership, we potentially have a board seat. When you get to the public market space, um, the companies are much bigger. These are like the companies of today and they're much bigger. A lot of them are international companies. A lot of them are conglomerates. So what do we have control over as investors? I think that uh, relates more to the ESG. So the governance practices, what are the operational practices? you know, these large, large international. So I like to think of it as kind of shades of impact to some extent where you have a little bit of a deeper, darker shade in the, the private market space. And then you that shades out and fades out. And as you get to um, the larger companies, you, could, you, you might focus a little bit more on the ESG side. And if I can just add to that um, in terms of defining a little bit more because people are going to see ESG a lot. ESG is everywhere, ESG investing, and they're seeing impact investing as well. And so really understanding the difference in, again, that intentionality, Olivia, I think is a really key piece for everybody to understand. So ESG investing really focuses on environmental, social, and governance factors as they relate materially to an asset's value. This is really the purpose is to increase that asset's value. It is not to make the world better. It is not to have a positive social outcome. If that happens in addition, fantastic, but that is not the primary concern. Impact investing on the other hand has more of a focus and primary concern of having that positive social impact in addition to um, making sure that that asset's value increases. So that's a key difference to me. I think you're on mute, Mar. 
Oh, apologies. Uh, did you want to comment on that, uh, the question ESG versus impact, or shall we move on to our, our another question that we have um, in the well, chat? I just concur with both Olivia and Shannon in regards to, mm -hmm. you know, there's different degrees on the spectrum in regards to where you're placing your, your, your hard-earned assets. Um, you know, and again, just being mindful based on... Uh, actually measurable impacts. And that's why we're so incredibly proud of being able to provide that to our clients in regards to substantiating um, the why and how we are managing the portfolios based on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which I'm incredibly passionate about. And there's a framework, uh, Morningstar Sustainalytics Impact Framework. Um, you can find it in on the Sustainalytics website, which is um, obviously um, so something of impact where Olivia said focusing on what your values and your, your goals are and directing your portfolio towards those actual um, themes on the UN SDG, um, you know, traffic, client, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure uh, I'm sure the the audience would love seeing that resource. So feel free to share in the chat, Jill. Thank you. So Alejandro came in with a question in regards in regards to the private markets. How do you, as the asset manager, make sure the companies you invest in perform appropriately? Do you have any weight in that? Um, it's probably a question for me in, on private markets. And I um, I think, first of all, we need to acknowledge that there are so many different type of private markets investments. So you can consider real estate, infrastructure, private equity, venture, all, all different flavors. So you would be expecting a different type of potential performance from, depending on what you're investing in. Um, and when you say perform, I think there's two areas of performance. There's the impact and then the financial performance, right? And our challenge is trying to balance both of those. Um, which obviously isn't easy. So I think on the financial performance, again, it depends on what you're investing in. So for us, uh, venture capital firms, we're looking for growth oriented companies. So we're looking for innovations, we're looking for uh, intellectual property, we're looking for the ability to scale. So all the financial considerations. And then when it comes to the impact, it's quite interesting because the companies we invest in are very young. You know, they might have less than five people. So um, like some of the operational, the governance stuff isn't as um, critical at that stage. And I think for us, we're really working with founders. So we're looking for that intentionality piece. Have they thought through a theory of change? You know, what is it that they're trying to do? Who is it that they're trying to impact? What are, would be the potential outputs? A lot of them don't even have a product in production yet. So a lot of it is like, what would I like to see as a potential output? And what would I like to see or measure over the next five years? And so we like to ask those probing questions to ensure that there's that intentionality and the alignment with the founders who are starting their companies. And as you go later stage with, with companies, you can start to measure more. Okay, have you actually, are you actually measuring those outputs? Are you considering that? How are you making those decisions? Um, is that intentionality actually being um, played out in, into fruition? And then as you get also to later stage companies, you can start to measure, right? Yeah. So, so you can measure within, let's say there's a, a group called Iris that has specific um, impact measurements. Typically what we would do in the private markets is we work with our founders um, because um, I think that, um, you know, sometimes they, the, the impact measurements have to, they, they vary, I suppose, as the companies get bigger and depending as the company kind of pivots. Um, but as you get to be a larger producing company, um, you get more data that you can start to track. Um, yeah. So that's what we would do is follow along and ensure that they are considering those data points and making sure that they're on track. Yeah. And I think like, you know, kind of listening to Olivia and what I'm reflecting on is, is the importance of why we're our, our two parties spring and, you know, we're not, we're not exhaustive in the entire market, but I think just partnering together on both sides and understanding that importance of, okay, all of the work that, that, that happens in the private market and how that impacts later the public market, but then also getting that messaging from 
you know, the 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 kind of the public markets, not just the companies, but also you know the the investees, um, in kind of that lead and direction of what's important on those impact metrics and kind of how this picture fits in holistically um, on both sides, so that we can really move the needle in the right direction. So as these you know smaller or earlier stage companies as they grow, um, they are kind of reflecting what's needed at that larger scale to move the needle, right? Which is so important. So I'm just gonna jump into a few more of the questions because we are getting closer to the top of the hour. Um, does it happen in a company that is excluded along the way because of new information? So, uh, and and how does that impact the fun where it was? Do you have an example? So I think where Colleen is going with this question is um, kind of, you know, how does perhaps Gen S adjust as you get more information where where they might not be, you know, when you get to that, okay, there's more reds and greens, or we hit that critical red to divest, how, how do you go about that decision making uh, information? And how does that impact the fund? Great question. Thank you. Do you want me to go, Shannon? <laughs> okay. And that is a really great question because we actually are, are have re-established um, some further screens uh, just recently uh, on our fossil free and impact portfolios. Um, Royal Bank is, seems to be a, a topic of conversation because in the past, um, we felt as though Royal Bank was doing the right thing in regards to um, their ESG initiatives. Um, subsequent to that, uh, with some recent news releases and eco-justice action uh, in regards to their greenwashing, as well as the fact that the Royal Bank is um, does falls outside of our realm and our impact space due to the fact that they are financing um, the they're one of the top ten percentile financers of the energy sector globally. So we will never consider you know a financial institution that would fall within those parameters. So in the past we have had Royal Bank within our impact our fossil free funds. Um, we have now excluded them. Um, similarly, in the past we had Tesla within our impact fund. But the controversies became so blatant um, that it went red and we had to liquidate Tesla um, again. So we are very fluid in regards to our measurements. Um, we go by strict parameters in regards to, um, you know, if that red appears on the screen or it falls um, within our tier ranking system based on the, obviously the company in regards to revenue or their UN SDG targets. Um, that's a consideration and it's and it's ongoing. Hope that answered. Do you want to add anything, Shannon? Um, I think you covered it well. Yeah, I think um, the only other, and I already mentioned this before, but thing to note is that massive amounts of data are required to make these decisions. And so, you know, we use those data providers uh, in order to help us make those decisions um, as quickly and effectively as we possibly can. And that's why it's so important to have that diversity of data so that we're getting as much and deep information to make those um, decisions quickly for our uh, clients. Thank you very much, Shannon um, and Jill. So we are getting close to the end of the webinar today. Just just uh, quickly, a question from Grace. Can someone outside of Canada invest in Canadian companies within Canada? Olivia, I'm going to hand this over to you. And part two of Alec Alejandro's question is just around, you know, how, how do you deal with the high risk? of investing into a young company, which, uh, you know, is something we know well. Um, so I'll throw those over to you. And when we finish those questions, um, I'll, I'll wrap things up. Thank you. Sounds good. So definitely international investors can invest in Canada, but I think it depends on the regime and the, the country that you're investing from. Um, so I've had a lot of international investors in my days, and um, you really need to work with your compliance department in the country that you are investing from, as well as your, your accountant, because there can be tax implications. But absolutely, there's lots of international investors investing in Canada, and we, I, I keep hearing, actually, that um, Canada is a budding place, for especially for climate tech, um, as well as great innovations with um, very reasonable valuations. So um, and hearing more and more international investors who are interested in Canada, which is fabulous to see. 
Um, in regards to Alejandro's question, great question. Um, venture capital is risky. Like let's let's make sure we put that out there. And I think Shannon made a good point at the beginning around um, you know, 10% of your portfolio to private markets. And I think that depends again on the plan that you have in place. The plan will consider like what are your liquidity, what are your risk constraints, um, what's your return requirements, all of those things. And then of course the impact piece as well. Um, uh, you know, I love I love venture capital because I think that's where innovation is. And I think that's where the companies of tomorrow come from. And I think the other um, critical piece of private markets um, and one of the main reasons that you see a lot of institutions investing in private markets is for the returns. So I was looking at the Cambridge Associates impact um, private equity return profile to give you a sense over five years, the average impact private fund had returned 15% annualized um, versus the MSCI world, which is the global public equity sphere, which returned 5% over the same time horizon. So if you're going into pri private markets, which are inherently more risky, you would be expecting greater return. So it's, there's this trade-off of risk versus return. Um, so I think, you know, you need to have a clear plan in place. And that's where having a great wealth advisor actually really helps work through like what portion of your portfolio goes to private versus public versus all these other underlying asset classes. We know it's not easy, but um, thank you for the question. And I think all, all of us, on the, particularly the Genesis people on the call would um, be able to work with you to, to come up with the appropriate asset allocation. Thank you very much, Olivia. I just wanna take um, a minute to thank everyone so much for joining this webinar, um, uh, joining Spring and Jenis, Shannon, Jill, thank you for your, your insights and experience um, and trying to give us a bit of a picture in, into the world that you work in and how we as individuals can make um, meaningful change in the impact space with our, you know, make our dollars count. Um, Olivia, thank you for taking time and, and joining and, and providing your perspective too, especially wearing both hats and having experience in the public and the private side. Um, really thanks to our audience and everyone for being here for the wonderful questions. Um, feel free to reach out afterwards if you do have any questions for the spring team or for the Genes team. Um, we're happy to connect to you. And um, yeah, we, we look forward to staying uh, connected. I think you've made the, the right first move in joining a webinar like this and learning more. I think education is paramount um, in this process. So really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thanks again, everyone. Have a wonderful day.